Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bevy Basics. In this episode, I'll be covering scenes, starting with what is a scene and how this pattern applies to different game engines. I'll then cover how Bevy specifically implements scenes, how you'd go about using the specific structs that Bevy provides you from its scene implementation, and finally, how to get and create some scenes to use in your game. This will include touching on Bevy's GLTF crate that allows you to import scenes and all their dependencies from that format and spawn them into your game. Since GLTF is such a large and wide-reaching crate, I will only be covering the scene section in this video and will do a future video on the whole crate. When developing games, it is sometimes essential to spawn large collections of objects, whether this is in the form of a whole level or specific parts of a level, such as buildings, where each wall and window may be a separate mesh with its own functionality. Most game engines allow some way of spawning these collections as a single object. For example, Unity has two separate ways of doing this, prefabs and scenes. A prefab is an object with a pre-constructed hierarchy of components and children, whereas a scene is much larger data structure consisting of prefabs and the entire hierarchy that you consider to be a singular object. Used to spawn entire levels or largely structured parts of levels, such as UI. Godot also provides scenes. I'm not as familiar with how Godot uses scenes for I have not actually developed a game in Godot. But as far as I'm aware, Godot doesn't separate between prefabs and scenes. Instead, allowing scenes to be spawned inside other scenes, creating the same effect as Unity's prefabs. Bevy also implements two types of scenes, but rather than restricting where the two scenes can be used to spawn objects, instead restricting the types of components that can be stored. Bevy has the scene struct, which is simply a wrapper around a world and has the full functionality of entities that a world would normally have. Whilst the alternative dynamic struct restricts you to only storing entities and their components that implement reflect, meaning you are only able to store some components. This is done so that Bevy can serialize and deserialize these components inside a dynamic scene. An assertion that Rust cannot type check without the additional trait provided by Bevy Reflect. You can watch my previous video on Bevy Reflect for more details about how Bevy implements this. Or my next video when it is released, which will be on how to create dynamic scenes and components more in depth and such as reflecting, deserialize, and serialize. When spawning or removing scenes from your primary world, you will get or need its instance ID, respectively. This instance ID is a new type struct containing a UUID that uniquely identifies the scene instance. The methods that Bevy provides to spawn a scene will give you an instance ID, whether directly or indirectly using a scene instance component. The scene instance component is just a wrapper around an instance ID used by Bevy to indicate what entities are the root of a scene. An entity also has a scene handle that indicates which scene the entity is the root of, and this allows for change detection and updates. There is one large resource provided from the Bevy Scenes plugin, and this is the scene spawner. It is quite a large struct compared to the new type structs covered so far, but is easily simplified to a collection of information about scenes, such as which scenes need spawning, which scenes have already been spawned, and which scenes are going to be despawned, along with su things such as scene information, which is a mapping between a instance's entities and the world's entities to allow for change detection. It is primarily used for spawning and despawning scenes, but behind the scenes, it is also managing the change detection of entities when things like the asset server has hot reloading enabled. When spawning a scene into your world, there are two primary ways to do this and one alternative way. Which way you choose will change how the scene can be interacted with later. First, you can use the scene spawner resource. This resource 
has methods that allow you to spawn and remove scenes from the world without a root containing them. Similar to Unity's scenes. It also has corresponding methods for dynamic scenes. When using the scene spawner to spawn a scene, you will get an instance ID in return. This can be used to remove the disjointed entities later. In the example on screen, I have a struct that is a resource holding the handle to my scene. I can then use this as a parameter in my system. When pressing S, this scene will store a local copy of the instance ID. Then when you press R, it will despawn all instanced copies that it has. A working example of this can be found in my GitHub repository, linked in the description. The alternative to the scene spawner is to use bundles. You can use either the scene or the dynamic scene bundle, depending on what type of handle you have. This is also where the alternative method in comes in. There's nothing preventing you from inserting a scene or a dynamic scene handle directly onto a pre-existing entity. This will functionally work the same as spawning it with the corresponding bundle as long as it already has the components of the spatial bundle. This does not have to be done when the entity is created and can be done anytime during the lifecycle. When a handle is added to an entity, a system will detect this, then spawn the correct scene under the entity and insert the scene instance component with the correct instance ID. As seen on this example, I am using the scene bundle with the same scene as from the previous example. But if you press A, it'll use the bundle. If you press D, it'll spawn a new entity with a spatial bundle and then insert the component. When you press E, it'll remove all entities that have a scene instance. This effectively creates the same effect as the previous example. In order to create a scene, you have three good options. You can either create a new world struct, insert some entities and components, then wrap the whole thing into a scene struct. This method does not allow serialization of your scene. If you need to be able to save your scene and then load them again later, this is where the dynamic scene comes into play. You can either Convert a normal scene into a dynamic scene using the corresponding method and providing the type registry you want. This will strip all non-reflected components and return the, stru the structure. Or you can create it directly from a world without wrapping it into a scene. Once you've done this, you can then use the run serialization method to get a string representation of the dynamic scene. This will use the type registry in order to make sure that it knows how to convert all the types into strings. This string can then be saved to a file with the extension .scn.rom. When you later load this scene with the asset loader, it will reconstruct the dynamic scene correctly. As seen in this example, that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm fetching the dynamic scene and then saving it to the file scene scn.run in the assets file. I can then load the scene. I activate watch for changes on the asset server and then load the scene from that location. Adding the assets server dot watch for changes means that if I modify the text representation of the scene, it will reload and then modify my game while running without needing to rebuild or restart the game. If you want to create your scenes in a different application, such as Blender, it is possible to Export your scene as a GLTF and use Bevy's built-in GLTF crate to load, extract, and then insert your scene and its dependencies such as meshes and materials. This can be a little more complex than the previous method, but this is only because the whole GLTF API is accessible from this point, whereas the other methods were only the scene section of much larger systems you would need to build and implement yourself. To spawn a GLTF scene, you first need to load the GLTF file. You, this can be done with the asset server. Once the GLTF file has been loaded and passed, you get access to its data using the GLTF assets resource. From there, you can access the scene's handle either by index or by name. It is also possible to use labels when loading the assets to get direct access to the scene without needing to load and then access in another system later.
As you can see in this example, I have a load GLTF system that runs at startup and inserts the GLTF handle resource, which is the handle to the loaded file. Then in the GLTF scenes system, I check for user input and if I get one, I both insert it from the GLTF scene zero, which I clone, or the alternative of using the scene one label and load the file again. Bevy is smart enough to determine that the file has already been loaded and will instead just fetch the pre-existing file data from the asset server. I hope this episode has been helpful and informative for you, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.